California Constitution forbids it. How does the court or state or federal government have jurisdiction or control over me? I mean, if I'm not a slave, then they don't have any jurisdiction over me. I guess I could volunteer to be a slave. The 14th Amendment gives us the legal definition of a United States citizen. So let's read number five. Here we have the 14th Amendment, and it states, passed by Congress on June 13, 1866, ratified July 9, 1868, although it never was lawfully ratified, as I think two or three of the southern states at the time had been taken over by military uh, tribunals and they, they um, unseated the governors that were elected. So you can't really legitimately say that the state voted for it since there was a military ruler. Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. So let's read that backwards and say all citizens of the United States are subject to the jurisdiction of the United States if they choose to be because as you see it says born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction it doesn't say all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the jurisdiction so if it says and subject that means you have to choose choose to be the and subject. So then, so if, if you state you are a United States citizen, you agree voluntarily to be a slave. And how many times do we see, uh, almost everywhere, you, do, you don't have an option not to state that you're a United States citizen. You want to open a bank account? You have to state, are you a United States citizen? What happens if you state you're not a United States citizen? Up, oh, no bank account. You want to get a passport? Are you a United States citizen? You want to get a driver's license? Are you a United States citizen? You want to get a marriage license? Are you a United States citizen? You file your tax return. I'm a United States citizen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance. Oath spoken. It's a trick. How would you like to pledge allegiance to my flag and let me be king? <laughs> so if you're a United States citizen, you voluntarily agreed to be a slave subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, incorporated, because in 1871, a corporation was formed, United States. Okay then, so here we are. We have right out of the 41st Congress. Let's see. There we go, 41st Congress. And what does it state? It states, chapter, an act to provide a government. An act to provide a government of, for the District of Columbia. Now what does it say there? February 21st, 1871. Volume, looks like uh, 17, page 16. District of Columbia constituted a body corporate for municipal purposes. Who gave them the authority to create a corporation to run the District of Columbia? I mean, did we vote on that? Did we vote on that? Who's the we that voted on making a corporation? Anyway, God has the highest status on the list as the grantor creator of all living things. And then we have man and then man's creation. Man created the constitutions. The constitutions created the governments. And then the governments created a creation of their own. What did the governments create? Well, they created the corporations, right? You're only a slave if you volunteer and don't get and don't upset the presumption of the court. 
that the court makes and the government makes that you are a slave subject to the jurisdiction thereof, right? Now let's look at evidence that the government is not de jure or lawful. That's what de jure means, of law. De jure, you know, because actually it's de facto. It's a government of fact. The fact that it acts as a government makes it the government, but it's not the de jure government. They're a corporation falsely representing themselves as having lawful authority. In court cases shown above, outline my right to claim that I'm sovereign. I mean, I showed you how the courts have ruled that I have a right as one of the people to claim that I'm sovereign. Do I have a right as a 14th Amendment citizen to claim that I'm sovereign? No. If I've been deceived into signing a contract giving up my sovereignty, is that lawful? What are the lawful elements of a contract? Can we take a look and see what the lawful elements of a contract are. And we see here on number six, where it says, and this is, this is right out of Black's Law Fourth again, contract, an agreement between two or more parties, preliminary step in making of which is offer by one and acceptance by the other. Now, wouldn't that mean that there has to be two signatures on the agreement? I mean, how do you signify offer and acceptance? Now, if it's a verbal contract, you can say, well, both parties stated verbally. But if you have a contract where one party is signing and the other party isn't signing, then it's not really a contract that signifies offer and acceptance. Okay, offer and acceptance by the other, in which minds of the parties meet and concur in understanding of terms. What happens if they deceive you and don't tell you what all the terms are? Then your minds didn't meet, did they? You don't have a meeting of the minds if you aren't explained everything. I mean, if you don't know what you're getting into, then it's an unconscionable contract. Nobody would get into a contract where they gave up the farm for a mess of pottage. I mean, you can't be tricked into doing things. That would be unconscionable because no man would enter into a contract like that. No man would enter into a contract where he gave something of value and received nothing in return. So, and that's from Lee, Tra Lee versus Travelers Insurance Company of Hartford, Connecticut 173 SC 185. And then, it is an agreement creating obligation in which there must be a competent parties, subject matter, legal consideration, mutuality of agreement, and mutuality of obligation. And agreement must not be so vague or uncertain that terms are not ascertainable. In other words, once again, we have to have a meeting of the minds. We have to have full disclosure. Each party has to know what they're getting involved in. There has to be legal consideration. Okay, consideration is something of value. Something of value has to be exchanged. If one party doesn't give anything of value, then the other party didn't get anything of value. And that's from H. Liebs and Company versus Klingenburg. And that's a California case, 23 F. 2nd, 611, 612. But these are out of Black's Law, 4th, 1968, page 394. Okay, so, so, we, so do we have a lawful contract? So let's say uh, if the state told you that by signing a marriage license, you would be giving them total control over your children and your marriage, but you didn't have to get a marriage license because that's really the way it is. Nobody is forced into getting a marriage license from the state. Would you, get, would you enter into that agreement? You know, to give the state authority over your marriage and the product of your marriage, which is, what does a marriage produce? Children. Or would you get hitched the old-fashioned way in holy matrimony? 